Hello, everyone, and welcome to Energy Visionary Platform. Uh, today, we have a special guest with us, and we're going to be discussing CHP technology and uh, something I've been working on um, as well to help educate uh, clients out there of all the different government grants, the different technologies, and the different strategies. Uh, we want to showcase some of these technologies and um, give a high-level view of the benefits and how how you as your biz as a business owner can achieve your energy savings and maximize the different technologies and strategies that are on the market and that have been successfully implemented. So today I want to welcome Matthew Swinemer with Calcut Energy, and today he's going to be discussing the benefits of combined heat and power generation or CHP generation. And we'll go through some of the some of the benefits and we'll ask certain questions that you might be thinking about this technology. So we'll get right into it. Matthew, welcome to Energy Visionary. Thank you very much, Aaron, for having me. It's great to be here with you. Yeah. Thanks for thanks for joining us on this Friday. But I got lots of time to hang out here. So this is a great way to spend my time. Good. Glad we can have you. Yeah, so I'm gonna share my screen, is that okay? Yeah, definitely. Well, yeah, I mean, just for framing the conversation, put together a bit of an agenda. Um, and I'm excited to kind of just start with the conversation around some of the problems that we have with power generally. And um, I'm, I'm based in Alberta, Canada, and so a lot of the examples I use, a lot of the content, a lot of the numbers I, I reference are uh, from, an, an Alberta's perspective, but the Colica does work all across North America. We have a, a big office in California, actually four offices in California, and we do work right across the whole, the whole continent. So just wanted to highlight that. So um, one of the problems with uh, uh, just generally how we generate power in North America is we use a lot of thermal power generation, whether that's coal or natural gas. And um, typically, the overall uh, efficiency of that from fuel into electricity to your house is actually somewhere in the range of 30 to 32%. So we're losing a lot of energy along the way, which actually ends up um, increasing the cost, but also it ends up increasing the overall um, CO2 produced uh, per kilowatt that's finally delivered to your house. Here in Alberta, we actually have relatively dirty power. It's actually 420 times, sorry, 420% uh, more CO2 output per kilowatt here in Alberta than, than the average of Canada. And that's just a reflection of the type of power generation that we use here in this province. Um, one of the other problems we have uh, is, 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 uh, is just the limitation of the grid. And Aaron, you probably have experienced this a lot more than I have, but a lot of times a facility will need to be built in a particular area or maybe they're wanting to upsize and they just don't have enough capacity from the grid uh, at their, at their current location or where they want to build their facility. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and as a result, they end up building, they have to spend a lot of money to get those lines or to upgrade the, the infrastructure. And, and specifically here in Alberta, we actually have a very overbuilt system and we actually end up paying on average, 50% of our utility bill is actually the cost of just transmitting the power. It's pretty crazy. Right. My utility bill at home is somewhere in the range of 65 to 70% is my wires and administrative charges. I only pay like wow. 30 to 35% for actually the cost of my electricity. Yeah, no, it's, it's true. And a lot of our clients might be manufacturers and um, yeah, definitely. They, they think they can go build out where it's affordable on some land out in the country and they go and they get their study completed and they don't have the power in that area. So now it could scrap your project or um, a big adder in cost to get that infrastructure built. So really good point there. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the major industries that really felt hard was uh, here in here in Canada, cannabis is legal. And so we do a lot of cannabis manufacturing in mm -hmm. indoor greenhouses and they use a tremendous amount of power and yeah. nobody thought uh, that they'd be using as much power as they, they, they are. And uh, yeah, there was, there was, uh, there was examples here in Alberta where greenhouses were, or indoor cultivation was using tens of megawatts of diesel power on site within 
spitting distance of big wires like this because it just couldn't get grid access in time. So it's a huge problem that that can happen. I have, I have added some QR codes if people want more information. We do have that videos on our website to these different particular topics. Perfect. And so the third, the third problem that, you know, there's lots of problems, but the third major problem, and I don't know how relevant this is, uh, Aaron, to a lot of your, your viewers is remote power. But the reality is, is there are facilities and there are places all across North America where it is, it is cost prohibitive to connect to the grid. Um, obviously in Canada, there's lots of examples of that, uh, whether it's in the Northern parts of Canada, but even sometimes just simply it's, it's just cost prohibitive. You're, you're near a city, but there's just not good, uh, good, uh, well, the cost associated with, with supplying power to your facility, it can be very cost prohibitive. Yeah. And, and this power, um, in fact, actually, I always find this stat interesting. So, so in Canada alone, there's 200,000 people that live in off-grid communities. Wow. Um, those off-grid communities pay for power in the range of a dollar per kilowatt. Wow. So on average here in Alberta, people are paying five to six cents. That's just their energy charge. They're paying a dollar. So, I mean, it's, it's tremendously expensive. And then because you're using specifically an almost um, – exclusively diesel uh, fuel, the, the, carbon, the carbon impact is, is quite high as well. So yeah, so those are just, I wanted to shape the conversation around power with some of those, those things. So let's get into maybe what is CHP? And um, what CHP is a, uh, it's a technology that effectively generates power and heat. So electricity and heat from a single fuel source. And what we're, we're effectively doing very simply is we're taking a generator and we are generating electricity for that grid. We're providing the primary source of power to that facility is the generator versus the grid. And we're taking heat off the generator and we're utilizing that in the facility um, to lower their, their, their heating costs. And overall, this creates a much more energy efficient process, as you can see on the screen, up to as much as 93% fuel efficiency but it can also help increase the reliability of power to that facility and it can reduce that facility's um, greenhouse gas output. So it can help become more sustainable. So those are kind of the three main, the main reasons, um, economics, reliability, and, and sustainability. And I just wanna jump in on this slide. So the, the photo looks like a barrel of oil, uh, <laughs> but in reality, that would be natural gas utilities that you have currently on your property that you would be tapping into to run uh, essentially a, a, a large uh, engine gener generator, correct? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I have a slide that gets to that, but a CHP could also be run on diesel. Um, it, it, like I said, it's, it's effectively, this is proven technology. We all have, we're all familiar with generators. Mm -hmm. What we're doing here, what makes this technology just that, that much more leading edge is we're, we're covering the heat off the generator, heat and energy that would have been wasted to the environment, right. and we're capturing that and making it overall more efficient process. Right. No, that's good. Yeah. So actually, here's, a, here's an example of a design that Colicut made for or inside a, a specific building. Mm -hmm. And I just I love this image. I'd like to pull away the exoskeleton, but it really does help us show what is going on here and simply put, like I said, it's a generator. You can see it right here. I'll use my mouse. You get your generator here with the, in your alternator. Mm -hmm. And what we're effectively doing is, so uh, cold water is brought from the building. It goes through this heat exchanger, which is taking heat from the engine. It goes up through this heat exchanger, which takes heat from the exhaust and you get hot water going back to the building. So power being generated here, heat being generated here and transmitted back to the building. So you just, you brought up a great point, um, Aaron, you know, the different fuel types. So again, so Colicut works with in lots of remote communities. We have lots of, of remote um, generation facilities and, and they run on diesel specifically. And there's nothing preventing us from recovering heat from that generator, from the exhaust out of the, the engine and utilizing that within some sort of facility on site. But to your point though, 99% of, of CHPs uh, globally run on natural gas and it's purely economics. Natural gas is in abundant supply and very cheap right now. Mm -hmm. And a lot cleaner than most people think it is. <laughs> very true. Very true. Yeah. 
So there's different forms of natural gas that we might use. So in some applications, you might use a synthetic gas. Um, you get a lot of this off, um, off um, gasifiers. Um, so it's a gas that'll come off maybe. Uh, uh, so there's a lot of uh, lumber mills that will, they will allow their, their wood chips to uh, effectively be gasified, which produces um, a synthet synthetic gas, which can be burned in a, an engine. Biogas, biogas is the next big thing. Um, you can take that off, a, off an anaerobic digester and run it in a generator. Um, we do lots of work and, and have had lots of interest in the area of biogas, specifically in California. And then finally here in Alberta, uh, being a oil and gas producing jurisdiction, there's lots of times where we'll have a waste gas that just it's either it's not economic to produce or there's just not a pipeline in place. And so we'll generate power using flare gas. Excellent. And on biogas real quick, we also worked on a project where a resort was looking to basically put their food and scrap waste into a bio generator and produce uh, fuel that way. So definitely a lot of different options you can take, but you definitely have to to learn about these technologies before you can really think to implement them in your in your facility or development. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and we can help you guys look at the options around biogas. Um, you have to be very careful with what, um, what generator you use for that because there, there are some impurities in that biogas that, that need to be considered when you're, you're choosing an engine. Right, good point. So, you know, the biggest question that your viewers and anyone watching this video and the people that are asking me, why would I install a CHP at my facility? And um, we, we've, one of the major reasons purely is it's, we're actually becoming so much more fuel efficient. So again, I think I've showed this slide already or we've alluded to this, but you're getting as efficient as 93%, whereas the grid, if here in Alberta, we're using coal, which is producing a tremendous amount more CO2, by the time it actually gets to our facility or gets to our house, we've already lost almost 60 to 70% of that, of that energy. It's, it's pretty incredible. Um, some technologies are better. I don't want to just discount everything or, or whitewash it is always terrible. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but uh, generally, that's, this is the benefit of CHP is we're, we're bringing that generation to our facility and we're able to realize that efficiency. And ultimately, that efficiency comes out in an economics opportunity. So we're, we're saving money. And um, I specifically uh, put on the, on the chart two, two jurisdictions. And this is relevant to a lot of other deregulated jurisdictions. But you have um, Alberta and, and California. And here in, Al here in Alberta, we pay on average somewhere in the range of 11 to 14 cents a kilowatt hour. California, on the other hand, they're paying somewhere between 23 to 26 cents. But we can very confidently produce power uh, for somewhere in the range of seven to nine cents per kilowatt, or that's seventy to ninety dollars a megawatt hour. And so, so there's a there's a, a major difference, what we call the spark spread between taking power from the grid and generating power on site. But the final thing that we can help realize that makes this economic so much more attractive is that heat savings allows us to offset the cost of what we would have been using for a, a, um, a fuel source to provide heat to that building, which again, ultimately for most buildings is going to be natural gas. Some facilities run on propane, uh, but Aaron, you, you correct me if I'm wrong, but like 99.9% .9 of buildings in North America are most likely heated by natural gas. Yeah, that's correct. Like the primary heating systems, uh, if you're heating a pool, definitely off a boiler, uh, natural gas is most likely the, the design in that property. Um, so that's what we're talking about when we say the heat savings. It's your domestic heating um, that would go through a heat exchanger or your space heating uh, for that property. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, good savings there. So the second reason a lot of people are looking at CHP is there's a lot of sustainability mandates that companies are looking to meet. How are they going to reduce their their uh, CO2 output or their greenhouse gas emissions output. And here in Alberta, we actually, for every one megawatt of CHP installed at a facility, you, uh, assuming that power or that heat is used all year long, you can see a uh, carbon reduction of somewhere in the range of 3000 tons per year. Wow. That's, yeah, that's equivalent to about 660 cars taken off, off the road per year. And so when that, when that, um, 
when the when your carbon uh, when the carbon tax here in Canada goes up to fifty bucks a ton, that is going to equal a significant amount of savings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really so, good slide for sure. I, one one thing I like to I like to compare. A lot of people really appreciate this slide. So, Aaron, one of the things that um, I like, one of the reasons I like to show this slide is I just like to compare the average um, uh, CO two output. Uh, per kilowatt hour here in Alberta versus some of the, the the benefits of CHP. And so for every kilowatt of power produced here in the province of Alberta, we're producing 0.53 kilograms of CO2. And that's specifically a function of the types of generation that we have here in the province. So you'll see that on the right, there's this giant, uh, this big uh, wedge of the pie, and that is coal power. And we're very quickly um, getting away from coal Mm -hmm. um, but nonetheless, we still have a significant portion of our base load is produced from coal. And so, as you can see on the graph there, that we're actually able to reduce our CO2 output using CHP by 47%, assuming we're using all of the heat of that CHP. And why is that? Because we're using a, a, a much cleaner burning fuel, which is natural gas, mm -hmm. and we're able to effectively offset the fuel that would have been used in the building to provide that heat. Perfect. Yeah, no, that that clearly, um, I think, represents the, the advantages of producing on site versus drawing from the grid. So, yeah, no, that uh, it, it makes perfect sense to me. So what are some of the places where a CHP might be put in? Like what type of applications? And you can see on the screen, I've got a lot of different options here. Mm -hmm. And I've put a little Alberta sign next to all of the ones that I am aware where on-site power generation has been utilized or CHP has been utilized. And I'll be honest, Aaron, right off the bat, there's probably a lot of other categories and there's probably a lot of examples that I'm not aware of, but, uh, but, there's a, but I just wanted to show this, that, that this um, on-site power generation has been very widely and the C's next to them are, are uh, applications or, or different types of industries where we have been involved, whether either we've supplied a, uh, a CHP or a power generation system, or we're actively uh, supporting it through maintenance. So yeah, lots of different um, industries have already adopted this technology. And uh, yeah, we're excited to see a lot more adopt as we move forward. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely a vast opportunity for this technology to help clients basically lower those um, utility costs and uh, maintain a little more re reliability for their systems. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, um, without further ado, why don't we get into the case study that we were going to chat about, which is yeah, absolutely, the, uh, which is the uh, the cogen at Red Deer College. Yeah, let's check it out. So we were commissioned to build a one megawatt uh, CHP at Red Deer College, and so the, what you're seeing on the screen is uh, it, on the left is what it looks like on the outside. So this is a a uh, a modular design. It's it's a skid based design that we built in our manufacturing facility in Red Deer. And uh, one of the benefits of this facility being so close to our manufacturing facility is we're able to build it a little bit wider. We weren't too concerned about transporting it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's allowed us to make this an incredible educational facility. Uh, that was one of the things that Red Deer College really wanted to see. And so this is quite a bit wider than your average CHP, but it really allows us to get in there and, and see around. And so this is a, uh, a facility that's producing about one megawatt of power and it's producing just over a megawatt of, of thermal energy. And that thermal energy is being used within the facility and it's being transported all the way to their pool as well. So this has been a, a great um, addition to the, the, uh, the, the university's um, a process of, of looking to reduce their, their greenhouse gas emissions, but also be self-sufficient in terms of power supply. The generator that's used is a Siemens for, uh, SG42HM engine. Um, in ideal conditions, that generator can produce as much as 41% electrical efficiency, 92% uh, overall fuel efficiency. Uh, this project is at uh, a relatively high elevation. If I remember correctly, it's about 800 meters. So there is some derating associated with elevation difference. But still, it's a, overall, it's a very efficient engine. Yeah, and if you have the, the space on your campus, you know, definitely, like you said, take advantage of creating this customized modular where you can get in and, and walk around and, and service the equipment. Um, yeah, it looks great. Yeah, so, so one of the things I wanted to highlight for your viewers is 
one of the biggest questions I get asked is how do you recover the heat? Um, and so what I've done here is I've taken the, the, the PNID, the process and, and instrumentation diagram. And I know you guys definitely can't read that. And uh, to be honest, you probably don't want to read it. Uh, <laughs> nerds, nerds like me nerd out on, on PNIDs, but I, I wanted to kind of give you guys a bit of an overview of, of what, how we're recovering that heat. And so effectively there's a big box in the middle and that's where our, our generate, that's the generator within that enclosure. And what we're doing is we're bringing in um, cold water into the generator, just like almost every generator has. It's called the jacket water. And that jacket water is coming into the engine and it's drawing the heat away from the engine so that that engine doesn't overheat. And then we have this other heat exchanger down at the bottom. I've used HX as the acronym, but what that's standing for is heat exchanger. And this is the exhaust heat exchanger. And so what's happening is, is just like a car engine, it's producing very hot gas that's coming out of the engine and it's going into that heat exchanger and then, we, and then out, out the heat exchanger to our silencer, which is then being uh, rejected to the environment. And then we're bringing that jacket water through. So you can see how, how the, the arrows are trying to indicate temperature differences. So you have cold water coming through, it's now been heated up a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then it comes into this heat exchanger here, which then takes it again, uh, you adding more heat here and the temperature rises um, through the heat exchanger. And then it comes to this heat exchanger here, which is called the, uh, the CHP heat exchanger. And this is where we transfer the heat from the CHP to the building. And so that, so there's, I'll just pull up the last arrows. So then on the other side of the heat exchanger, we have cold uh, water coming from the building through this heat exchanger and then going back. So this is a, called a plate and frame heat exchanger. And it's a, it's a water to water heat exchanger where we're transmitting heat from the hot side to the cold side. So typically on all heat exchangers, you're gonna have a, a hot side and then a cold side, cold side and hot side. So we're transmitting, and these, these heat exchangers can be very, very efficient. So then obviously that cold water comes back through and it goes back into the generator. So then how is the heat then being transmitted from the CHP that you saw in the photo before um, to, to the building? And so on the outside of the CHP, you'll see these two insulated lines here. So what we've got outside this, this uh, the modular enclosure is these two four inch lines. I know those don't look like four inch lines. They've been insulated because here in Canada, we get down to minus 35 degrees Celsius. So they need to be insulated. And so we've got a two four inch lines uh, so this would be, a, 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 one's the supply, I believe this is the supply and this is the return line and supply to the building and return back. And, um, and so it's a four inch line with three inch of insulation to, to get a 10 to 12 inch um, outside cladded line. And effectively what's happening is that, C, that CHP heat exchanger that we saw on the previous slide, we've, we've taken the heat from the, the engine and the jacket water, it's been consolidated. And now we're taking this and we're flowing that fluid back through the heat exchanger and back to the building. The heat loop at Red Gear College is actually two, uh, it's a, I think it's 1500 feet long, like the, the, the whole loop. Oh, wow. So it's an incredibly long loop. And so when we're, so then on the building side, we're then, we have another set of heat exchangers where we are transmitting the heat from this intermediate loop to the building loop. Excellent. And that's all, like you said, in our cold climates and to prevent the heat loss, th that uh, temperature me or the fluid medium is mixoglycol, correct? Yes. Yeah. Typically we do 50-50 glycol water. On the heat exchanger side and then the building loop, because it's in the building, could be just uh, treated uh, water for closed Absolutely. loop system. Okay. Yeah. And a lot of our applications our heat exchanger is in series with the boiler and literally the water that comes through the heat exchanger into the boiler ends up being consumed at the facility. So yeah, you definitely don't want to put glycol in it. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so with the preheat temperatures, how much is that boiler even running if, if ever, right? Great question. Um, so well, we can take the, the fluid up to 90 to 93 degrees Celsius at, at the high end. Mm -hmm. So depending on what temperature your boiler set, that boiler might not need to do any more work, which is what right. Red Deer College is actually seeing when this CHP is operating. Um, they're definitely seeing a, a significantly reduced demand on, on their boiler system.
let's actually look at what this facility looks like on the inside. And uh, Colicut, we, uh, we filmed did a 360 view of the, uh, the facility itself. Oh, wow, that looks great. Yeah, so what we're looking at here is here's the engine. As I showed you, here's the alternator. So here's where we're generating 480 volts uh, power. So approximately one megawatt is being generated. And uh, what, as I showed earlier, so the, so this is our exhaust heat exchanger here. And you can see the exhaust coming out of the engine here. And so as, as I showed before, uh, you, we've got the jacket water is coming through the engine, taking the heat from the engine. It's taking about 500 kilowatts of heat from the engine. And then it's coming up through these lines here. It's going um, into the shell and tube heat exchanger. It's taking heat from the exhaust. It's taking it from about 450 degrees Celsius down to 120 degrees Celsius. So there's a pretty big temperature change oh, yeah. um, on, the, on the, uh, the exhaust. And we're taking the temperature of the water from about 60 degrees to 80 degrees. Really just show you how much more energy there is in water, yeah. uh, water temperature rise than there is in exhaust. So here, I'll just zoom in a little bit closer so you can see what's going on. So, so as I said, you can see there's the exhaust coming out of the engine coming up and into now this here, for those of you that are interested, this is an exhaust bypass. So let's say the facility doesn't need the heat or we don't want to superheat or we don't want to boil the water inside this, um, inside this heat exchanger. So we go to uh, the bypass mode. And so it goes straight from there through the bypass and out to our, silent uh, out to the silencer on the outside so I talked about how and I'm just going to scroll to the other side of the engine so you can see actually while I'm here so here is our electrical panels so this is called the switch gear and so this here is the engine control panel this is what's controlling and monitoring what's going on and by the way we can actually do this remotely we can I could pull up the uh, the viewer for this CHP and see how it's doing and see all the parameters. And then the other uh, couple panels are uh, the, the panels that are synchronizing the power from the generator with the power from the grid and then transferring it to the facility. Very clean job. Looks great. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? And then I'm just going to the other side. Mind my navigating. Mm -hmm. So like I said, this is a very wide facility. You wouldn't normally have this much space. This is a real blessing, especially for our, our mechanics who have to go in and do uh, maintenance on this. Okay, so what are we looking at here? So we're on the other side of the engine and what we're seeing here, this is our uh, makeup oil tank. So the nice thing here is you have this nice uh, site here that tells us how we're doing. So we're starting to get a little bit low on our oil reminds us to come in there and add some more oil or do an oil change. And here, this is the plate and frame heat exchanger. And I'll zoom in here in a second, but what, what's happening here is that consolidated heat from the jacket water and the exhaust comes into this heat exchanger. And this is where the heat is then transferred from the CHP loop in this, in this uh, facility here. And it's transferred through to the intermediate loop. So let me zoom in. So you guys can see, and this is, as I said earlier, this is a plate and frame heat exchanger. I actually built one of these in university. It's really, really boring to build <laughs> because it's a, it's a series of plates. With the gaskets. That, that, exactly, yeah, and you wanna make sure you get them right because if you put them on one wrong way, I mean, it's, yeah. yeah. So as you can see here, if, if we wanted to add more flow, what we would do is we'd take this plate off here and we would just add more, add more uh, plate. Uh, more gaskets and more plates. So, so you can see here, this is the heat coming from the exhaust, coming down and into this plate frame heat, heat exchanger. And I'm sorry, I can't show you guys from a good angle, but you have the, the building supply and return lines down here, which are coming into the bottom of this heat exchanger. And that is how the heat goes from the, the CHP loop to the building loop. Excellent. And as far as a building control or automation standpoint for a client, they would have access to see 
you know, the system live and it actively working. Um, correct? Is that the dashboard you're referring to? Absolutely. So this particular system, we use a Comap controller. And with that, we can monitor and control uh, the engine and we can monitor all the other sensors within this facility. We can monitor and we can historically chart that as well. Other systems, we have the ability to, uh, we, we have the ability to see how much heat we're storing. This particular facility uh, doesn't have BTU meters on the, uh, on the uh, heat exchanger plate. Um, but yes, there's, there's a lot of abilities to integrate the, the controls, the system with, uh, with a facilities BMS or building management system. Excellent. And obviously the programming of this would all be automatic. If there was down for service, it would switch over to, um, you know, the grid or your boilers. Yep. That's all, that would be all part of the, the control system. Part of the Absolutely. Package. Yeah, so part of the, the controls um, programming, we, we sit down with the client, our electrical engineers determine what's the order of sequence that we want. So uh, does the generator come on first or do we draw power from the grid? And, and, and how do we do that? So it's, um, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's a very interactive process with the clients, facilities engineers or facilities people and, and, and our programmers. So, I, I didn't want to get too deep into the design of CHP, but one of the things I did want to talk to is some of the high level things that we consider when we're designing, designing a CHP. And, and it really does depend on the level of complexity that we want to go. And I guess my, uh, my uh, slide transitions haven't been working appropriately, but <laughs> my, one of the things I wanted to show here is that we typically start with, a CHP is designed around the engine. And then from there, then we're going to determine the, the right uh, power generation alternator. So what's, what, what voltage is your building at? What, what's the right voltage to be operating? Are we 480, 600? Are we, are we medium voltage? Are we 4160, 13.8? Um, are, we, are we lower voltage or higher voltage than that? And then we start looking at heat recovery. And then, and then we start to get into some of the fancier stuff where does your facility not need heat, but actually need chilling? We've been looking at some data centers where they don't need heat, but we could take that heat and, and put it into an absorption chiller and produce chilling. And then for some of our greenhouse applications, they actually look at CO2 recovery. And so, so there's a lot of levels of, of a design complexity based on each application. Then on the right side, there's the, the integration with the facility itself. So, or, or, and, and meeting the requirements of, uh, the jurisdiction that we're in. Different jurisdictions will have different emissions requirements and different regulatory uh, regimes. For example, California and Ontario, for example, have much stricter emissions limits than what we do here in Western Canada. So it's something you always have to consider. Power synchronization. How, how are we going to synchronize that power with the grid and, and then transmit it to, to the facility itself? Physically, how are we going to mechanically connect the heat from the CHP into, into the building? I, I did kind of talk to that in the previous slides. And then regulatory, there's, there's a lot of regulatory aspects to these projects and, and uh, making sure that we're in, in line with current legislation and legislation to come is definitely a huge, uh, huge item to consider. Right. So <clears throat> just for this overall topic, we're giving, you know, the viewers here ideas of what, what is possible possible Absolutely. for their uh, development or property. Um, yeah, there, there are different steps, but that's why you would bring on, you know, us as consultants um, and, and professionals like Matthew to go through and do that due diligence to, to get the best project for your needs. So yeah, it looks like a lot, but um, you know, this is what we do for a living. So um, you're in good hands. <laughs> Well, and, and absolutely to your point, Aaron, like when we're, when you and I go away and, and support someone with a feasibility study, which we can get into here shortly, these are some of the things we'll consider for you guys to make sure that when you guys move forward with a project like this, or if you move forward, that we're, we're making sure we've ticked all the boxes and nothing's going to surprise us at the end. Yeah. One of the biggest questions I get at this point, if someone say, yeah, I like, I like what you're saying. We're going to save money. We're going to reduce our, our CO2 consumption and we're going to increase our reliability of power on site. What's the next step? What's that first step? 
And, um, and so really at, at this stage, you know, Aaron and his team and, and our, my team here at Colicut, we're going to want to look and understand your facility um, energy consumption. What are you consuming on a monthly, seasonal, annual uh, basis? But what are you also consuming on an hourly basis, whether that's in the middle of the day or at nighttime? And from that, we can, uh, we can do, Colicut can do a very high level feasibility study for you guys for free. That's our gift to you. And then from there, depending on, on the results of that study and what you guys think, we can then move into a, a much more in-depth engineering study where at that point we'll size out a CHP. We'll do that sort of a review. We'll then physically go and install it to your building. And then at the end of that, we're going to uh, have a long-term maintenance uh, agreement with you to make sure that that equipment is being taken care of. Yeah. And then on the consulting side, obviously on the design, uh, like you mentioned before, how does that integrate physically with the building's electrical systems mm -hmm. and natural gas systems? So that's where we would come in um, on the design side and provide full construction documents so that you can uh, tender out the installation because um, Calcut would supply that equipment, provide, uh, like you said, the maintenance on it. Uh, but they don't necessarily complete the installation of the services and the piping throughout the property, correct? Absolutely. Yeah. Excellent. So as I said at the beginning, this, I, Aaron, I know that you have, uh, you have viewers from all over North America. Uh, the major area that I operate and that Collicut operates is here in Alberta. And, um, and I know that in lots of jurisdictions, there are lots of different types of grant opportunities, but I did want to highlight three or four active grants here in Alberta. Uh, and I know that you know a lot about these, Aaron, but right now here in the province of Alberta, there are specifically three, uh, potentially four, um, definitely three uh, grants available uh, that are, that CHP is, is definitely applicable. It meets the, uh, the technology readiness level and it's shovel ready. And uh, so the first one, which is already expired now, is the, the tier IE uh, industrial energy efficiency uh, grant. But that was up to, uh, up to $20 million per project. The CHPs are typically under $20 million, so um, mm -hmm. and up to 75%. Um, and then uh, some of the other ones that are still open is the one through ERA. Um, that's up to, uh, so funding amount is between $2 million and $15 million. And then the, the one that's probably the most uh, relevant to your average sized CHP or combined heat and power system is the one through Alberta Innovates, uh, which is again through Alberta's tier, uh, tier program, which is uh, offering up to 75% financing for shovel ready projects. And they're willing to um, support a project within the range of uh, 200,000 to $5 million. Excellent. Yeah. And just to add to, to the point of these grant opportunities, uh, definitely feel free to reach out to us. Um, if you have the funding in place and a project, that's what the shovel ready means is that you have already taken steps on preliminary, preliminary designs, you have funding in place, you submit this application and you will apply to get a portion of your project paid for, uh, for reducing those emissions. So definitely take advantage. And um, like I said, through energyvisionary.com, we're constantly populating uh, any updates on grants or uh, funding that the government will be putting out. So we're definitely going to be seeing a lot of that from the federal and provincial and municipal levels um, to help stimulate the economy going forward for sure. So who is Colicut? And, um, you know, we, we are a, a very innovative company and um, we've been around for close to 30 years and uh, in, in a couple of different iterations, but uh, Colicut is a is solutions focused company that's really based around engine specific applications. So we've been we've been building compressor packages and uh, and power generation equipment and combined heat and power systems for well over thirty years, based predominantly out of uh, Red Deer in Canada, and then uh, we have three or four offices in California. And uh, you know some of the things that we do is we provide uh, design. Oh, no, my videos aren't playing. Oh, there they go. Uh, design, manufacturing, and service support. So I love this slide. 
Um, what we're seeing on the left there is a, a diesel generator that was designed. You're seeing in the middle it being constructed. And on the right, unfortunately, is not the, the one that's being manufactured. That actually is Red Deer College again. <laughs> uh, but uh, I love this slide. I love seeing that engine go in. Um, yeah, that looks great. Yeah, um, cool. and, and as far as your role, I, we didn't really touch on that. But yeah. um, maybe you could speak to, to how a client interacts with you along the way of getting this uh, completed. Here's my contact details. Um, my, my job is to, uh, to see if CHP or onsite power generation makes sense for you and your business. My goal is to see you guys save more money, reduce your utility costs, reduce your, uh, your CO2 output. And, um, and uh, the first real stage is me looking at your utility bills, looking at, uh, at what you guys are consuming in terms of power and seeing if we can come up with a way of helping you guys uh, realize those opportunities through, through CHP. And, and I'll be honest, you know what, there are times where it just doesn't make sense. And uh, we want to make sure we, we get you to that stage as fast as possible. Excellent. And um, just for obviously the way things are right now, we're, we're filming this during COVID. So yep. uh, depending on what type of lockdown, obviously, I'm sure Matthew would prefer to meet for a coffee or meet in a boardroom. But uh, just like the format we're in right now, Zoom calls might be the way or Teams might be the way to do it. So definitely reach out to either myself or Matthew yep. if you're interested in getting that first step completed. Is it uh, worth it for your property or development? So. Absolutely. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Like there's, I love, I love meeting people in person. I love going to people's facilities. I love getting to know what people are doing. It's so cool. Aaron, and I know you get to that experience as well, but one day I'll be in a food processing facility. The next day I'll be in a, I don't know, a greenhouse or a manufacturing facility. And, and it's just cool to be able to see all the different types of industries and, and ways we can help. It is. And I agree. I like to walk the property as well. Um, get a sense of location. Uh, we didn't really chat about this, but during our feasibility walks, we look at uh, a variety of options for a location to put this uh, CHP. And obviously we do, we do consider um, who are your neighbors, you know, environmental, if you're in a national, you know, we've had clients that are in natural, national parks and they've installed these. Um, so definitely something, you know, maybe you could speak to is the footprint and then possibly yes. the noise that someone might say, well, it might be too loud for, for my community. Yeah, that's a really good question, um, Aaron. So CHPs can come in all shapes and sizes. I'm going to go back to this guy here because I think sure. this, this does a really good job at, at, at showing. So I showed you a, a Red Deer College's facility was was intentionally designed to be wider, but we can have what's called a skin tight unit that can be as, as, as narrow as six feet uh, wide and eight feet long. And we have them. In fact, Chinook mall has a very small, see, I bet you I have a photo of that one. I don't believe I should know. I don't, I don't have a, but to uh, that point, from... Chinook mall is right in the middle of a community and uh, you know, absolutely. no complaints. And it's just part of the, the, you know, system for that property yeah. to operate. Aaron, I've been going to Chinook Mall since I was like three or four years old. I <laughs> lived, I lived not, I, I would walk to Chinook Mall. I used to live in Mayfair and um, I did not know that CH, uh, that Chinook Mall doesn't have but one CHP. They have four, they have four CHPs in the mall. Wow. So um, you would never know. Um, you would never even know where they were. Um, but yeah, we fit them in, in the utility rooms and, uh, and so they're, they can be very small. So, so you can have very condensed, uh, units. We can build them inside the unit. In fact, um, we get asked all the time, can we actually build a CHP in the room? And absolutely we can, we can break an engine down, haul it into the space, um, haul it upstairs. Uh, and so, so CHPs can be very easily, uh, uh, installed in, 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 relatively inconvenient places and that's part of that feasibility study that you were saying is can we can we actually do this is there a place to put it if not well let's let's call our call our day but we, we've done some pretty cool things yeah and similar to you know a lot of if not all apartment buildings downtown that have emergency generators yeah. um, similar code applies for a, um, a chp inside a property as far as 
fire ratings go, sound levels, yep. and uh, life safety on that front. So, yeah, definitely part of the first step is, you know, where can we put this piece of equipment? Exactly. And sometimes the roof is what you're seeing here is a 265 kilowatt unit in Edmonton. You can see the, uh, the Stantec towers in the background. Oh yeah. And that's on the roof of a, an office block. And then right across the road from it, we have a, uh, a 600 kilowatt CHP that's in a boiler room. So again, they in a, a multi, uh, a multifamily dwelling uh, apartment tower. So, so all shapes of sizes of CHP and all types of applications. Yeah, definitely worth to check it out. Um, if you do have a sustainability or a goal with your company to lower those emissions or lower those utility costs, mm -hmm. you know, CHP is definitely a, a great option to look at to make a big dent in that goal for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, so I think we touched on this a bit as far as placement of this unit on in a property and the concern of noise levels mm -hmm. and possibly even and smoke, you know, is there, that might be uh, one idea out there that these might be too loud and too smoky for a community, but could you touch on that? Yeah, yeah, let me just pull up a quick slide. Um, let me go back to the Red Deer College. So, so this, this package here, uh, it, it is within 50 meters of residence on the, on the Red Deer College property. And to my knowledge, there has been no noise complaints about this facility. So, um, so relatively close with, with very uh, minimal uh, noise. So this, this unit itself produces noise. Um, it's been mitigated down or, or attenuated down to 75 decibels uh, at 10 meters. And that's, that's a typical standard. So somewhere in the range of 65 to 75 decibels is what we design these these uh these systems too and i'll be mm -hmm. honest with you they're no more louder than your average chiller on the roof i've been to a lot of facilities where i'm getting drowned out by uh not by the generator that's on site but the but the chillers that are on on site right uh, those, those big fans yeah and if there is a particular concern from a client definitely in your design process you can beef up insulation yes. um you know bigger mufflers that sort of thing so Definitely, you can work around um, noise concerns for sure. Absolutely, yeah. It, it's a combination of extra insulation, like you said, and then just maybe uh, a, a larger and more powerful uh, a silencer or muffler. And what about all the black smoke that's going to be uh, pumped through the community? Is that a is that a concern? <laughs> well, the beauty of burning natural gas. I mean, if you've ever lit a pilot light with you, you know a, a, a typical any lighter, furnace, yeah. <laughs> exactly right there's no black smoke um, yeah. that black smoke you're seeing is typically sulfur and diesel and there's no sulfur in in uh in pipeline spec natural gas at least there shouldn't be yeah and if there, you do see black smoke it's not burning properly so if yeah. that goes for your chimney or hot water tank at home like call call a service technician for sure <laughs> <laughs> exactly yes so so aaron there is no black smoke perfect yeah Good question. Yeah, so I just want to ask um, on behalf of the viewer, so reliability. Um, I know we touched on a bit, but basically we're utilizing natural gas um, as the fuel source to produce electricity on site. So the reliability of not being 100% dependent on the grid. So when a, when a client does invest in this uh, technology, they are still connected to the grid, but their correct. costs would be reduced, correct? That's correct, yes. So one of the things I'm always discussing with uh, my clients is this is not becoming the, the primary system, as in like there is always a redundant system. This is your, your, it's an economic opportunity. It's mm -hmm. not the primary uh, system. Now, it can be. It can be if necessary, but most CHPs like Red Deer College, they are still grid connected. So if this right. CHP goes down for maintenance, they're still grid connected. If the CHP goes down and they're not producing heat, they still have the boiler capacity. Right. So it's completely redundant um, and, uh, and you're taking advantage of the, the cost savings and sustainability benefits versus um, taking your facility off the grid per se. Excellent. And you did touch on this, um, the maintenance portion. Um, yes. So obviously this is an engine, it has to be maintained. So that's rolled into the purchase agreement depending on the project, correct? 
Yeah, it really does depend on the, the commercial arrangement. And, and we haven't really got into that, but you know, you might say, Matthew, I, I see the benefit of CHP, but I don't want to own any of it. I just want to see the benefits. And, and, and so we could come in and take complete care of it. So supply and work with Aaron and his team and other great installers and build this and just take care of the maintenance and charge a per kilowatt charge. Um, or you may say, no, I actually want to own that and do maintenance myself. And so we can support in a lot of different ways. But uh, one of the things we do look to do with uh, a, a CHP client is establish a long-term service agreement with, uh, or LTSA is kind of the acronym that people use, so that we're taking care of that engine. Think about your car. Think about how often you take it in for an oil change and you got things serviced. Think about if you ran your car 24 seven, think about how often you'd need to be taking it in, how frequent you need to be doing that. Well, that's what we're doing here. We have a big, big car engine running on natural gas, not gasoline or diesel. Um, and so that routine maintenance, routine checks is something that needs to be considered. And that's very important uh, aspect of CHPs. Excellent. And obviously depending on how well that equipment was serviced, what is the expected lifespan? And of course, this depends on the project, but typically lifespan of, of these engines and these systems. Great question. So we, um, we build all of our, when I do uh, a maintenance schedule, I base it off uh, most likely uh, a, a 10 year period, but these generators can run 20, 30, 40 years. Uh, we have generators that have been running for a very long time. Um, and it, it just, it comes down to, like you said, it comes down to maintenance. Uh, at certain points in, in that maintenance, we're effectively going to rebuild the engine. We'll do a top end overhaul or a complete overhaul. And we'll effectively almost rebuild that engine, but everything else still works. The alternator, the heat recovery equipment. And so to answer your question, these generators could easily run 30 years. Excellent. And I know, again, depends on the project, yeah. but purchase cost or um, payback periods, what type of what are we looking at as of today? What are you that's seeing? A, that's a great question. And um, it is uh, subject to so many variables, but in my opinion, a good project where I say this is a feasible project, I'm looking for a payback period somewhere between five and eight years. That's, that's a, that's a good range for me. Um, uh, and then, and then, to, to put a budget, it's quite difficult because every installation is different. The equipment might be similar. One megawatt here and a one megawatt there might be the same cost of the equipment, but the installation cost could be dramatically different. But no, like I said, we're looking for that. A really ideal project is, is, is five to eight years. I think that's what I said. Mm -hmm. And then a, a, an okay project would be somewhere between eight to 11 years. Um, yeah, so that, that's probably the, the economic windows I'd be looking for in a good feasibility study. Yeah, and, no, and that makes sense. And that totally depends on how much of that CHP can use its, its uh, heat to, to offset in that property. So it totally depends on what type of yeah. um, facility we're looking at. So uh, exactly. that, that makes sense for sure. Uh, one thing that... Uh, I was thinking about is the energy purchasing side. So obviously in Alberta, we're a deregulated market, mm -hmm. which means you can shop around for your power, fuel. Um, so that's definitely something to consider when you're looking at CHP, because if they've purchased a block of energy from the grid, um, they got to make sure if they all of a sudden take that offline with a CHP, they don't get penalized and have to pay for that. Uh, have you come across that? And um, yeah, what are the, the certain things we check for when we go into a project? So, so in Alberta, your wires charge is set at the single um, 15, the single largest uh, electrical draw um, uh, across a 15 minute period. That's called your ratchet rate. And I'm not an expert on this area. There's some very intelligent people here, but effectively if, you are going along at one megawatt of power consumption and then suddenly for a 15 minute period, you jump up to three megawatts, the wires charge of your utilities costs. So the, the cost of transmitting, it's gonna be set at that three megawatt mark, not the one megawatt mark you're at. So 
So you can install a CHP and it might take you a little while to realize those savings. You also might be tied into, depending on how new your facility is or how new your contract with your, your, um, your lines provider, whether that's Fortis or Atco or Equus or someone else, you might be tied into a contract and you might have to buy yourself out of part of that contract. That's something we can help you with and help you determine as well. So that's your wires charge, but then there's your energy charge, whether, where you've got a contract with Nmax or direct energy or someone like that. And now again, again, I'm not an expert here, but my understanding is it's a lot, lot simpler to be able to get out of that uh, than it is your, your wires charge. So there are some things to be considered there. They're not, they're not uh, roadblocks as I call them. Mm -hmm. They're hurdles, something to consider. Um, so that's, that's kind of the, the energy consumption side of things. Now the second side, and I want to actually show a slide. Yeah, for sure. So what a lot of people don't realize uh, in Alberta is that power is trans is uh, traded all, almost just like um, shares on the, the New York stock exchange. Um, power is actively traded on a, on a, I think it's on a 15 minute interval, but don't, don't quote me on that. But what you're seeing here is power prices uh, of 2019. This is what power was traded for at the pool price. Um, and it, it kind of oscillated down here in that $30, $40 range as high as a thousand dollars a megawatt hour. Wow. It's actually, it can't go above nine, nine, nine. And I've been told but the reason why Alberta power prices can't go above 999 is because when this system was originally made, it was writ on DOS operating system and <laughs> DOS couldn't handle four digits. So I don't know wow. if that's true anymore, but that's why uh, power prices are limited to, from a trading perspective up to a thousand dollars. Anyways, why am I showing this? Because when you are a small uh, producer of power and you meet the micro generation regulations this is a a set of regulations set by the AUC I believe allows you to export power onto the grid and you can actually actively trade and sell power at the market rate and so this is another way that you can make CHP that much more lucrative there's a lot of complexities to this but we can help you uh, realize realize this other opportunity of not just saving utility costs but also uh, it also becoming a, another form of revenue for your, your facility. Excellent. And that obviously would utilize a two way meter so that you would track how much power you're putting in onto the grid. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's a few things you need to, you need to uh, install um, as part of your application to sell power onto the grid. It's not just simply you just hook up and power goes on. It's, there's quite a process to it. Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely worthwhile touching touching on this topic. And then, you know, as we work with particular clients, um, going more in depth into the different opportunities with this technology. Absolutely. Excellent. Well, I appreciate your time here today, Matthew. And uh, I, I recommend anyone interested in CHP for their property, uh, for that stabilized or lowered utility costs, reach out to Matthew or myself to get the ball rolling for your project. I appreciate your time, everyone, and have a good day. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you, Matthew. Have a good, have a good weekend. Thank you.